Um, so greetings from Berkeley, California. It is my pleasure to be a moderator for this exciting talk, which might easily be the international highlight of Thai politics in the first quarter of 2021 by two young Thai politicians, Thanathorn Jung Rung Rungkit and Parit Vachalasinthu. My name is Titi Jamkajawan Kiat, a PhD candidate in South and Southeast Asian Studies at UC Berkeley and the academic head of the US-based Association for Thai Democracy or ATD. Let me first thank the Center for Southeast Asia Studies for agreeing to host this event out of solidarity. Let me say a few words about ATD, the main organizer of this event. The Association for Thai Democracy or ATD was founded by US-based Thai students and professionals in October 2020 to mobilize international support for a peaceful democratic transition in Thailand. If you are interested in our cause, projects, and future events, please consider visiting our website and following our social media accounts, which I will be posting in the chat box later. Now, allow me to introduce our distinguished speakers, Thanathorn Jung Rung Rungkit and Parit Vachara Sinthu, which barely require any introductions. Thanathorn co-founded and led the now outlawed Future Forward Party as the opposition leader with the dual goals of restricting the military's power and advancing democratic reforms in Thailand from 2018 to 2020. Presently, he co-founded and is leading the progressive movement aiming to reform the constitution from outside the parliament. Thanathorn is one of the most persistent voices against the military and Thai conservative establishment today. His biography can be read as both a testimony to the military's oppressiveness and likewise hope for the progressive future of Thai democracy. Parit, a full-time social entrepreneur and Oxford alumni, became a full, sorry, became a professional politician in 2019 to run in the general election that year with the Democrat Party. He then resigned from the pro-military Democrat Party and founded a civil society group called Constitutional Lab or CONLAB to campaign for two systemic political changes. First, a unicameral parliament, and second, a drafting of a new people's, not military's, constitution. It is not an exaggeration to say that in the next hour, we are privileged to hear from and interact with the two living consciences of Thai democracy today. This talk is structured as the following. Thanathorn and Parit will each give 20 to 25 minute presentations followed by their initial conversation, if any. Then we open the floor up for Q&A until the event ends. During and after the talk, feel free to post your questions or comments in the separate Q&A box. Please also specify your current affiliation in your post. Kuntana Thorn, now the screen is yours. Elected versus elite, Thailand's final battle for democracy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone from Thailand. Um, actually, it's privileged to be here um, today, this morning. And um, I would like to thank the organizer for your attention on the stage of the um, struggle for democracy in Thailand. I would like to spend um, the next 20 minutes discussing about the current state of the struggle and the, um, how I think uh, we should move forward. Um, do you mind if I share the screen for my slides? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, very good. Um, so I would like to talk about um, I would like to talk about the 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 status we are in right now today, and I believe that um, in order to do that, you have to start with the um, with an understanding of the relationship between the military, the capitalists, and the treasury traditional elites um, that forms an alliance of unelected powers. You see, the, before, the, before the passing of King Ramanai, the working of this alliance was of, often implicit, low profile, and that's why some in the inner international academic circle called it um, deep state. But after the passing of King Ramanai, 
the alliance faces an um, existential crisis. The central role played by the King Ramanai cannot be replaced. This relationship is therefore entering a new phase and is still, in my opinion, a work in progress. Roles, powers, and organizations are being readjusted within and between these three groups. This process includes the extension of powers of the tra traditional elites An authoritarian government with absolute power was required to oversee this, as this adjustment. And that's the true reason for the coup d'etat in 2014. This relationship have given them mutual benefits to those in this circle in the past and continue to do so until today. So I will discuss a little bit um, what's in it for these um, for these uh, forces. First, let's start with the army generals. What in what's in it for them? You see, the under this structure, the army general, the military, they enjoy um, special and democratic status. The military is beyond the control of elected governments and um, they have unchecked powers and privileges. For example, um, and no military budgets. Basically, there's no accountability or no transparency in the, um, in the military budgets. Uh, members of the parliament elected um, by the people have no power to scrutinize the budgets of the military. Um, Leaders of um, leaders of the armies they also enjoy the board seats in state-owned enterprises, and this is in a way very similar to um, um, what happened in Myanmar. They also control lucrative, military-based businesses, for instances, boxing, horse racing, golf clubs, radio frequencies, even rotary. The retired generals are reported to have, on average, 80 million Thai baht worth of assets. So this is basically pretty much what they enjoy under this under this alliance uh, by proclaiming that um, they are there to protect the king, to protect um, to protect the 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 nation. They have the, these special privileges. What about the capitalists? You see, most leading Thai business families are part of this alliance. Um, this alliance gives them a basically a special mode of capital accumulation that allows the capitalists to be extremely rich without having to innovate. In the West, if you want to be rich, you have to innovate. You have to come up with a product or a service that is better or cheaper than what is currently in the market, but in Thailand, you can be, you know, super rich by having a close connection within this circle. Um, they enjoy special protection from competition, um, from foreign competition um, in particular. This ranges from liquor industry, banking industry, retails in energy, just to name a few. I give you one example of this. Um, my example today would be the case of King Power. King Power is a name of a company that um, received the concession to do the duty free business in the Suwannapum Airport the, and other major airports in Thailand. Um, the, this company, King Power, just received a new 10 year concession. Um, in 2019, um, when there was an election in March 2019, and after that, uh, when there is uh, when General Bayut was still a caretaking prime minister, he awarded a new 10-year concession to King Power. Um, um, and then last year in February 2020, um, 
because of the spread of the coronavirus, um, this company got a rental fee discount um, from the airport of Thailand worth 30 billion baht in February. Uh, King Power is the largest donor of the Palang Pacharat party, the party that nominates General Payut to be the prime minister. Um, 20 years after receiving the, the first concession, the, the, the owner of this company is reported to be worth 3.8 billion US dollar. So basically, the, you created 3.5, uh, 3.8 billion US dollar business empire in the time span of 20 years without having to innovate. But this is what you get from being in the close circle of this um, alliance of unelected powers. Then let me move on a little bit um, to the traditional elites. After the 2014 coup, General Prayut issued various laws that extend and consolidate the power of the monarchy. The, and the extension of powers invade into political sphere. And that moves Thailand closer to absolute monarchy rather than to constitutional monarchy. And that is the problem. People see that, people witness these changes and some have been very vocal about it. Some have been very um, brave to speak it out. Many who um, um, stand up and speak out about this being prosecuted, some of them still in jail, some of them um, are now um, being, in, being prosecuted. I give you three examples of this. The first is the Sankha Act of 2018. This act basically transferring the power to appoint or to remove the, the 20 members um, of the Sankha Council, the highest governing body of the Buddhism in Thailand um, to the king. So basically the king has the power to appoint or to remove the council members. And that is the, um, never been done before. The, the members of the councils, members of the Sankha um, Association, they chose and they elected um, the council members among themselves. So the 2018 Act, Sankha Act, is basically giving the king um, to dominate the, the Sankha Association. Another example would be the Military Transfer Act of the 2019. This act basically transferred the Army's Infantry Unit 1 and Unit 11 to the direct command of the king. So now in Thailand, you basically have two, um, two armies, one under the Minister of um, um, Defense, and the other is under the command of the king. And that is the not normal in any constitutional monarchy. And the third would be the Crown Property Bureau Act of 2018 and 2017. This act basically allowing the king to transfer billions of assets under the Crown Property Bureau to his personal name. So this basically extend and consolidate the power of the new king. And that is pretty much um, that is pretty much undemocratic. The king can do no wrong because the king can do nothing. And with all these acts, the king basically have the powers to, um, um, to intervene. For example, in the case of the Crown Property Bureau Act, the king transfer the assets under Crown Property Bureau to himself. And this is very problematic in the sense that now the king is a player in a market. He now controls shares in, for example, Siam Cement, um, Siam Cement Group. He is now controlling um, directly, the, directly the shares in Siam Commercial Banks, for example. So he is basically a shareholder in these companies. 
And when you are a shareholder in a fair market, you know, you should have the same right as um, everyone else. There's always a dispute between majority shareholders, minority shareholders, and employees, and dispute between board of directors and shareholders. You know, these things always happen in business. But the king has the protection, the immunity. No one can sue the king. So it's now a dilemma. You have two contradicting, two contradicting um, roles. One being the head of the state, and another one being a shareholder in a business company. So um, with this, you know, you got the three demands. The three demands that um, arise from three demands that arise from the, the demonstrations of youth, of students, um, the rallies that happened over the last eight months, I think can be called an anti-establishment movement. And it is basically never seen before in modern history of Thailand. And the, the I think what important is the, the uniqueness of their demands, the three demands, what is um, generally known as the three demands. And why is that? Because it's, um, it's I think they challenge the cultural domination of the elite to the core. Um, this is something very new and um, something um, very bold. Um, the three demands are number one, the vaccination of general period. And the second one is a new democratic constitution. And the third is the reform of the monarchy. Um, for me, this is basically the voice of the generation. The issue of the monarchy reform has never been the, um, made public before. And it's for the first time in decades that these demands been made public. And more surprisingly, it is widely accepted. I mean, at least among the young people. And that's why I think the elites, the establishment, they are terrified because they've never seen anything like it before. Um, I give you one or two examples on this. The, the not standing in a cinema when uh, the royal anthem is played is one example. Declining to attend the um, university graduation ceremony, ceremony, which a member of the royal um, family normally presents the um, certification is another. Um, um, so for me, uh, we are living in a very interesting time. But the point is, how to make the transition, the democratic transition peaceful, how to win this struggle for democracy. I think um, when I look at the struggle, I see it more or less as a journey rather than an event. There is no one winning um, um, event that you could topple all this. The, the, the regime and Thailand could be back to be a, a democratic country. So I look at it as a journey. So when you talk about the journey, you, you need to have a clear idea what, of what is to be done now, near and far. So for me, the most important thing now is about the winning the battle of ideas. I think there's many people still believe, not believing in democracy. Many still, many still have a preference of Thailand being an absolute monarchy. And I think unless and until you win the battle of ideas, you can't win elections, you can't um, amend the constitution. So now it's all about campaigning. It's all about convincing people that Thailand can be better under a democratic government. Thailand has the 
Thailand has the potential to be better if the ultimate power belongs to the people. So um, we now putting our energy and our resources in campaigning for this. We believe in the hegemony, the power of ideas, the powers of um, ideology. Without this, we can't win. Without the support of the majority of the people, we can't win. In near term, I think um, Kun Parit will be able to talk in details about this. Uh, we have to amend the 2014 constitution. This is the big obstacle to the future of the country. Um, the 2014 constitution is um, was the, enacted by under the military regime. Um, and there are many mechanics inside the constitution that um, that um, prepare that were prepared to have the general Bayut Jan Ocha back as the prime minister. And those mechanics have to be um, amended. Um, and uh, without, you know, without amending the 2014 constitution, um, the unelected force will continue winning in elections. And the, for the, the, the far, for the far, far um, journey, we have to win an election. Ultimately, having a democratic Thailand through an election is the most peaceful mean. Um, I, when we talk about reforming the monarchy, reforming the military, you have to have powers and the most legitimate way to have power is from an election. We understand that the laws and the, the election laws um, do not favor us. We understand that winning, but, uh, but, but it's the only way, um, it's the only peaceful way to do that. So I think, again, I emphasize on the peaceful transition back to democracy and um, in my order, now near far, you have to win the battle of ideas. You have to amend the 2014 constitution. And finally, you have to win an election. So the, um, again, I would like to leave the last message, the message of hope here. Over the last 88 years of democratization in Thailand, since the 1932, we have gone through the 29 prime ministers, 20 constitutions, and 13 coup d'etats. On average, we have um, um, a new constitution in every four years, a new prime minister in every 2.5, 2.9 years, and a coup d'etat in every six years. And this has to end. This has to be the things of the past. Too many people have died for the struggle for democracy in Thailand. And no one should, no one should die for this anymore. And uh, I believe that this is the best opportunity in generation, in decades. Um, um, I know it sounds, maybe if you look at the situation, maybe it sounds hopeless. Our friends are now in jail. Um, um, there's no justice. The, um, the judicial system um, is not any more respected, but uh, and they still have all these firm grips in in the parliament. So I know the situation maybe may seem may seem hopeless, but um, for me this is the most exciting moment in history, and this time general change is possible. I believe. So with that, I conclude my presentation and I would like to um, thanks for all the support um, um, internationally that the international communities have given to Thailand. Um, I hope that uh, with our best efforts, we can ha have one day a uh, democratic Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kun Thanathorn, for your incisive analysis and a message of hope. Kun Parit, please take over the screen from Kun Thanathorn. 
Parit's presentation title is The Democracy Tug of War in Thailand. Hi, everyone. I believe it's a good evening to our audience in the United States. Um, can anyone can everyone see my screen? Just wanted to check that first. Yeah, that works perfect. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I think would like to thank the university for, for, for having me here. It's an honor and privilege for, for me to get to speak in front of um, students um, in the US as well as an international audience around the world. I think today um, I will try to delve kind of deeper into uh, the issue of the constitution, um, which is one of the very important issues that Gunther has highlighted out as being um, a shorter term um, target that we need, to, we need to achieve in terms of amending the constitution to be more democratic. But I want to begin my talk by um, asking this question, because I noticed that at the moment we have quite an international audience. I want to begin by asking the question of where do people think Thailand, um, or where, 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 does people th where do people think Thailand ranks in the world on democracy? And this is a question that I actually pose to um, um, kind of students that I go and lecture uh, with. And every time I review to them the answer based on the um, democracy index of 2020. The answer always surprises um, students and young generations in Thailand. Because if you look at the democracy index um, in the latest year, ranking countries from first to 167th in terms of their levels of democracy, Thailand actually comes in at number 73. Now, this, the reason for this surprise um, is that a lot of students and younger generations in Thailand feel that this number um, is too good to be true in the sense that with the struggles they are finding um, on the ground. They do not believe that this is an accurate representation of where Thailand's democracy lies. So I try to analyze this question um, deeper to understand why kind of this mismatch between reality and expectations, um, how, how it came about. And I think part of the reason may be that we are facing a decline of democracies around the world. So in a sense that Thailand is not doing so well, but many countries also experiences, are also experiencing declines in democracy, meaning that the relative ranking um, has been kept near the middle of the table. But I think the more plausible explanation and is the context behind the title of this talk is that when we talk about measuring a country's democracy, we're talking about measuring two different things which can move in opposite directions. On the one hand, we are uh, measuring what I call um, the, the, level of the, um, the level of democracy in the system. So how democratic is your system? How democratic are the laws that govern the country? But on the other hand, we're also measuring what I call democratic culture or democratic society, which is how much do people in the country really believe and really want to call for um, a democratic um, system and a democratic society. Um, this can be um, related to what Gunther Nathan mentioned about the battle ideas that are happening within the country at the moment. And I think the reason that um, Thai students and Thai younger generations feel that um, Thailand's ranking of 73 is too high or too good to be true. It's because these two um, things are moving, are moving in opposite directions in Thailand. On the one hand, we have a political system is, that is very backward and that is declining in terms of democratic, um, in, in terms of democracy. But on the other hand, we have a society that is becoming increasingly progressive and increasingly um, demanding of democratic values and democratic system. So when you have these two opposing forces, it creates that gap between what the students and the younger generations feel that they would like to see in the country and what the actual situation is. Now, when we talk about um, a backwards political system, I think the word that I want to kind of describe um, what the system is right now is what I call the Prayut regime. Now, the reason I use the word Prayut regime is to accept the fact that we're not, we're not battling against one specific person that is General Prayut, but it's, it's an alliance of multiple um, organizations and entities um, that are collaborating to prevent Thailand from becoming a democracy. I think Kuntanathan already mentioned um, three um, such organizations, the military, um, the large conglomerates in Thailand and the traditional elites. But one key source of power that has been able um, to, to that, that the Prayut regime has been using to extend um, their powers is the, the current 2017 constitution that is in place at the moment. Now, when we talk about um, the current constitution, which is actually the 20th constitution um, of the country um, since its transfer to, to, to become a democracy 88 years ago, this constitution has problems acro across both its origins, uh, how it originated, across its process, how it was uh, verified and ratified. 
as well as the content within the, within the constitution itself. To give you a bit of background for the international audience, this 2017 constitution actually has a very undemocratic origin. It started, the, the, the drafting process for this constitution started after uh, General Puyut conducted a military coup and installed in place a military government under the name NCPO or National Council of Peace and Order. The, co the constitution was drafted with zero public participation with no single um, persons or, or members of the general public being called to express their opinions in terms of what they want to see in this new constitution. But even more dangerously, when the constitution was being drafted, the NCPO or the military government at the time tried to position themselves as a referee. The image that they wanted to present to the, the country was that they wanted to become a neutral arbiter that would write the rules for the political players to then compete in. But as soon as the military um, government was um, abolished and the first general election was held, it became very clear that the NCPO had no intention of just becoming a referee, but they actually stepped into the field and acted as one of the key players in Thai politics at the moment, with the head of the NCPO, um, General Puyut, um, becoming the candidate for prime minister of a political party called Palang Pasharat, which is the leading political party in the current um, coalition government. Um, it got to a, po to a point that um, it became very clear that the rules written by the NCPO in the constitution were designed in favor of the pro-military um, Palang Basharat party, up to the point that you have this quotation in front of you here, which is um, from the current uh, Minister of Justice, um, self-proclaiming or admitting that the current constitution was designed for our benefits, quote unquote. But apart from the undemocratic origins that we saw in terms of how the constitution was drafted, um, we are often um, led to believe, or we're often, uh, or the people supporting the current government always try to claim that at least this constitution passed a democratic process. Now, it is true that back in 2016, there was a national referendum that was held to ask the question of whether the people in Thailand would like to accept this constitution or not. But it's worth noting and it's very important to emphasize that that referendum was far from free and fair. Not only was a lot of information withheld from traditional media in terms of what is actually written in the constitution, but the rules that were put in place did not allow for both parties, both those who supported the constitution and those who opposed the constitution to campaign on equal grounds. On the one hand, uh, every household in Thailand will get um, sent by mail to their houses, a copy or, or a summary um, booklet um, outlining the benefits of the 2017 constitution. But on the other hand, when we had campaigners or students who wanted to campaign against accepting the constitution to highlight what are the flaws and deficits within that constitution, many were actually prevented from doing that and many were actually um, arrested. So you can see that the referendum was not um, a free and fair one as you would expect under international democratic standards. But in addition, um, when you walk up to the ballot to vote on the, on the, in the referendum, you're also met by confusing and very leading referendum questions. Um, at the time, back in the 2016 referendum, there were two questions that were put in place. The first was a simple yes or no, whether you accept the, the, the 2017 draft of the constitution. But the second question is exactly as you see in front of you here. It's a very long-winded question that asks if you agree that in order for the country to undergo continuous reforms as per the national strategy, that in the first five years, the joint houses of parliament should be responsible for selecting the prime minister. This question um, can be translated to something much more straightforward, which is essentially, do you agree that um, the military appointed um, senators um, can participate in the election of prime minister? Um, but the, the reason that they try to make this um, question as confusing and as leading as possible was to try and sneak in um, this undemocratic measure. So you can see that not only was it originated from the military government, but the current constitution also passed through a referendum process that was far from free and fair, free and fair and not um, a democratic um, process by international standards. But all of that is kind of in the past, but what we are living or what we have to live through at the moment is the implications or the effects of the undemocratic content that is written in this um, constitution. And if you try to analyze um, the 2017 constitution, especially in comparison with constitutions in the past in Thailand, we see two key sources or two key sets of changes that are, um, that are essentially sources of the democratic deficit 
that you see in this current constitution. The first set of changes is that you are seeing um, an erosion or reduction of the protection of civil rights and liberties, which should be one of the most important objectives of any constitution in any um, democratic nation. But the second set of changes that you see is an expansion of powers of multiple unelected bodies and mechanisms. The combination of these two sets of changes mean that actually the 2017 constitution by its content is even less democratic than its predecessor, the 2007 constitution, or even the predecessor before that, the 1997 constitution. I think it's fair to say that Thailand's democracy, at least from a syst systematic point of view, has declined or regressed by over 20 years. Now, if you dive deeper into why the contents of the current constitution are so problematic, let me take you through these um, kind of two um, key sources of deficit. Um, the first one or the first set of changes is on the erosion of the protection of civil rights and liberties. I think first and foremost, we have to admit that the way the rights and liberties are written in the current constitution is much more diminished or much more reduced compared to previous constitutions. One example that I put on this slide on the left hand side is an article related to the right to health care services. So if you look at the previous constitution back in 2007, um, the message you will see is basically the, the, the text there in full. It will say every person has an equal right to receive healthcare services that are appropriate and of a good standard. But if you look at um, the same article in the current 2017 constitution, the words in yellow were written off. And right now it only reads, every person has a right to receive healthcare services. So you can see that on the one hand, there are, there are multiple cases of these rights and liberties, which have been written in a way that are diminished compared to um, the previous constitutions. But equally or moreover, um, we are also seeing certain rights removed entirely from the 2017 constitution. Uh, one example of that is a right to a healthy environment, which was put in place back in the 1997 constitution, constitution to make sure that the government takes a more serious stance on climate change and environmental protection. This right is now no longer um, included in the current constitution. But apart from the reduction of what's actually written in the constitution regarding rights and liberties, there are also some rights that are actually written in the constitution, but are not fully protected in practice. If you look at the constitution of Thailand, you will see that um, there is one article that states that every person will have a right to free speech. But what we are seeing in practice are actually um, certain legislation that are um, written and enforced in such a way that actually limits that constitutional right to free speech. One controversial um, law um, that is being more talked about in public at the moment as in, and it's being pushed by the protesters as one, as one of the key demands uh, for abolishing this law um, is um, the Thai Criminal Code Section 112, which is essentially um, a criminal law um, regarding um, defamation um, of the Thai uh, monarch. What you see here are basically a comparison um, of the punishment levels or the criminal punishment um, sentences for um, defamation laws against general persons across different countries under a constitutional monarchy system, you will see those bar charts in red, as well as criminal punishment for defamation laws um, against the monarch across these countries. I think with this chart, it becomes very clear that the current um, article um, or the current section 112 has a few issues. Um, number one um, is that um, it, there is no clear distinction between what is to be um, counted as a criticism and what is to be counted as defamation, insults, and threats. The second um, problem you see here is that the level of criminal punishment is much, much higher compared with countries with a similar political system. So if you look at this chart and look at just the red portion of the bar chart, you will see that actually the criminal punishment for defamation laws against general persons in Thailand, um, albeit quite high, is not that much higher than international global uh, standards. But if you look at the blue, blue part of the bar chart, which is the criminal pun punishment for defamation laws against the monarch, you will see that the current sentence of three to 15 years in prison is much, much higher, three or four times higher um, than what we are seeing um, across international democratic standards. And finally, um, in Thailand, this law also places no restriction on who can start the accusation process, which means that actually anyone can always file charges against anyone um, who they believe or have accused of violating um, this um, legislation. And then finally, on the, on, on the um, erosion of the protection of rights and liberties, 
we are also seeing um, this 2017 constitution increasing the number of excuses or reasons that the state can use for violating or limiting civil rights and liberties. If you look at Article 25 of the current constitution, you will see that um, they have put in place more conditions for the state to be able to limit civil rights and liberties. They have phrased these conditions as saying that the state is now allowed to limit rights and liberties in case of effects on national security and peace and order. Two very controversial phrases that have been um, um, that are uh, mainly interpreted only in one way um, by the current um, NCP or the current um, Prayut Reji. So we often see uh, multiple cases where civil rights and liberties are limited in the name of national security when actually what was being um, what was being done was in no way um, no way um, at risk to actual national security was but was simply um, legitimate criticisms of the current government. But the second set of changes that have made um, this constitution um, undemocratic by content is the expansion of powers of unelected bodies that we see. And there are four kind of um, examples of four um, sets of bodies and mechanisms um, to which this applies. The first one is the expansion of powers of the Senate. Now, one of the most undemocratic articles in the current constitution is Article 272, which actually allows for the military or NCPO appointed 250s um, member Senate to be able to um, select the prime minister alongside the 500 MPs. So if you think of this mathematically, um, you have um, a situation where 750 people um, are assembled in parliament to vote on who becomes the country's prime minister. 500, 500 of them are elected MPs that are elected by uh, the public um, consisting of um, 38 million people who went to the ballot box to vote in a general election. That means that if you divide kind of the, the share of voting powers, 67% um, given to 500 MPs by the 38 million people who went to vote, that means that each one member of the general public um, has not point not 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 one seven percent of a chance in terms of determining who becomes prime minister, but if you look on the right hand side, you will see that with the two hundred and fifty um, senators, which make up thirty three percent of the voting power, all these two hundred and fifty members are appointed by the NCPO, which means that it, the NCPO holds about thirty three percent of the voting power uh, on who becomes prime minister, and if you work this out mathematically, you will realize that that means. Um, in terms of determining who becomes prime minister, the NCPO or the Prayut regime actually um, has equal power to 19 million people. That, mean that, that means that you have to assemble 19 million uh, members of the public um, to be able to combat the NCPO. So if 19 million people uh, want one certain person as prime minister, that is completely offset if the NCPO wants another person as prime minister. But apart from the power to... Um, select who becomes prime minister. There is also a heavy imbalance uh, between the power that the Senate or the Thai Senate has and the democratic origins of its members. Because on the one hand, we are seeing that um, the 250 members of the Senate are not only, they're not only um, just appointed, but they're appointed by a process which is heavily skewed towards the Prayut regime. Um, of the 250 senators, you have six who have their seats in the Senate automatically because the six seats are reserved for military leaders in the country. You have an, another 194 members who were directly selected by NCPO, and you have another 50 who were indirectly selected by NCPO, which means that there was a process which led to the nomination of 200 people, and NCPO then selects the 50 that they deem is most suitable um, out of those 200. So on the one hand, you have a very low um, democratic origin um, of these 250 senators. But on the other hand, they have um, a large amount of powers uh, in addition to selecting the prime minister. They have the power to block any constitutional amendment. If you want to amend the constitution, you need to get the approval of at least one third of these um, senators. They have the power to vote on laws re relating to national reform. And they also have the power to appoint members of the constitutional court, as well as members of independent organizations like the Election Commission and the National Anti-Corruption Commission. So this is one of the key bodies that are unelected but have increased powers as a result of the 2017 constitution. The second body is the um, constitutional court and independent organizations. Um, the main kind of um, tricky, um, the main trick that the NCPO did was to 
revamp the appointments and nominations process, whereby during the nomination stage, they reduce the involvement of academics that are normally put in place to try and nominate the, the most suitable people for these organizations. But the most dangerous part is that they revamped the appointments process um, in such a way that any person who is nominated for to sit in the constitutional court or to sit in any of these in, independent um, organizations where political neutrality and impartiality are so important, they cannot be appointed unless they are approved by the 250 military appointed Senate. The third unelected body or mechanic that has been put in place um, in the 2017 constitution is the 20 year national strategy plan. Now on the surface, um, this national strategy plan may seem a little bit harmless and if anything useless in the sense that any attempts to predict what will happen to the country in 20 years is something which is much more futile um, an exercise given how volatile, how uncertain, how complex and how ambiguous changes in the, in the um, global economic and social landscape is um, right now. But what's even more dangerous is that the constitution have put in place mechanics to punish um, elected politicians or elected ministers if they adopt policies that may get the support from the general public during, during the election, but are not on paper uh, in line with what is written in the 20 year national strategy that was written by um, the NCPO and its alliances um, themselves. Which means that whenever we have a different um, political party or political force in power, there is a chance that the NCPO's mechanism and the Prayut regime will use this national strategy as an excuse for um, punishing um, elected politicians um, across the aisle. And bear in mind that the largest punishment carries um, um, a sentence of, of up to 10 years um, in prison um, as well. And then finally, um, the fourth kind of body um, that is unelected, but um, that have had in, an increase in, the, in its powers um, as a result of the 2017 constitution is the institution of monarchy. I think this is something which Kuntanathan has already mentioned in detail, but one key source of contention that has been put forward by, by protesters who are demanding for the reform of the monarchy is that the current constitution was actually amended in seven articles after it had already passed the national referendum back in 2016. And some of these amendments of these seven articles have led to a certain increase in the powers of the institution of the monarchy, whether it's the power to be able, or the option to be able to decide on whether to appoint a region or not, if the monarch were to be in a foreign country, as well as certain articles that led to follow up legislation um, that meant that the crown property uh, was much less under the management of an elected um, parliament. So that is kind of what we are seeing in terms of the backwards um, political system that is pushing us below or, or pushing us backwards in terms of the advancement of democracy. But on the other hand, we are seeing an increasingly progressive political society that is willing to call for and push democracy forward. We are seeing a society empowered by technology um, that enables for the general public to be able to more freely express their opinions on Twitter, to be able to use um, technology as a way to um, check and balance the government to call out whatever the government adopts policies that are not in line with public interest, as well as as a, as a mechanic to crowdsource information and um, investigate any um, allegations of corruption by state officials. We're also seeing um, newer generations with a more independent mind. We are seeing um, more and more um, members of the of the youth in Thailand actually holding very different political opinions to their parents and their grandparents. I think one phenomenon that we saw in the latest election, um, which we did not see in many previous elections, um, was um, um, the, uh, the students and the, the youth um, voting for a different party to their parents. I think beforehand we are uh, used to the idea that, or used to the, 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 the phenomenon whereby each household, regardless of age, tend to vote similarly in a general election. That is no longer true in the latest election. And we are seeing that these kind of younger generation are not only calling for um, democratic um, system um, and amendments to the constitution, but they're also calling for policies that embody democratic values of liberty and equality, whether it's the abolition of con conscription or calls for um, same-sex marriage in Thailand. And these people have been fighting um, by, the rule, by, by the playbook or by the rule book. They have been very patient and are currently being pushed to li the limits of what they can do to call for democracy. 
I mean, despite the constitution being put, being written fully in favor of the current Prayut regime, they still went out in full force um, in a general election, hoping that they can, um, they can still win um, this fight. Even after the election, even after the 250 military appointed senator voted for General Prayut to become PM, they were still willing to fight uh, within the parliamentary system. It was only when um, the constitutional court abolished um, the Kuntanathorn's um, uh, future forward party that the students decided to take to the streets and felt that parliament was no longer um, the mechanic to achieving that change. And we are also seeing specifically within that movement, a huge public mobilization on constitutional amendment. Um, towards the end of last year, we had over 100,000 signatures coming out, um, over 100,000 people coming out to give their signatures uh, within the space of 40 days, which is a record set for any um, attempts by um, in Thailand to collect signatures for um, legislation um, proposals. Um, um, needless to say that once this proposal was put in parliament, the um, 250 military appointed senator block the passing of this constitutional amendment. And I think as Kuntanathan mentioned, the issues that are put forward by these um, student-led um, protesters are, are some of the most progressive issues um, that have never been put forward in the public sphere before in Thailand for decades. So this is kind of where we are at the moment in terms of this democracy tug of war. Uh, on the one hand, we have a system that is backward, but we have a society that is becoming much more and more progressive. So I think I want to end this um, talk by sharing with you what we have in mind now uh, in terms of how we move forward regarding um, amending the constitution. I think firstly, it's, um, it's important to emphasize that we need to do two things in parallel. Number one is we need to call for um, the drafting of a new constitution to replace the 2017 constitution. But on the other hand, while that process is happening, we also need to make sure that any problematic articles in the current constitution need to be amended immediately as well. And this is exactly what I will be doing uh, this afternoon, which is we are kicking off um, a new constitution campaign to collect um, signatures um, to submit to parliament um, to dismantle the Prayut regime. So the current constitution allows for 50,000 signatures to be assembled and to put forward a legislation that would be uh, considered in parliament. So we, are, um, we have drafted a proposal and are currently collecting um, those 50,000 signatures to put into parliament. Um, the main articles of that constitutional amendment proposal um, include four things. And there are four, four, four proposals to basically um, remove um, the powers that the Prayut regime currently uses to extend its um, powers and prevent a path to democracy. Number one is to remove the Senate and adopt a unicameral system. Number two is to, to reform how constitutional court justices and committee members of independent organizations are appointed. Number three is to repeal the, the problematic 20 year national strategy. And number four is to reverse any previous legalization of orders or undemocratic and authoritarian orders that were issued um, when the NCPO were in power under the military government. So I think my final uh, message of this talk is perhaps not a message to the people um, who are fighting for democracy in Thailand, but it's actually a message to the uh, political elites that are either um, people who control, manage, or benefit from this backward and undemocratic political system. Now, when you look at this tug of war, um, you might think that at the moment there are two kind of equal and opposite forces being put in place. You might think that um, you still have um, um, uh, a stronger, um, a stronger hand or you might have a better chance of winning this battle. But I leave you with this one simple fact, which is the wind is really only blowing one way. Society is only gonna become more and more progressive. Society is only gonna become more and more demanding of democracy. So this fight is not a fight that um, is static, but it's a dy dy dynamic fight where the wind will always only blow in one direction. So unless um, you um, want, um, unless you want the rope to break, which could be a symbolic representation of there being um, fighting on the streets and violence erupting in the streets, I heavily urge you to walk in the direction of that wind, walk in the direction of that tide of change and compromise with a progressive political society that is being led by younger generations who are calling for democracy. Because if that rope breaks, not only will it um, indicate uh, a potential risk of violence, but it also means that it is you guys or the people holding the system, people who are benefiting, benefiting from the system that will be left behind um, in this change. So 
I want to end my speech um, on that on that note. And and once again, thank you, um, the university, um, and thank the university for having me here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Kun Parit, for soberly analyzing the democracy tug of war situation in Thailand for all of us. And as Kun Thanaton said, and also Kun Parit said, we are in a very exciting time. The changes are happening in front of our eyes. And before we get to Q&A, which are overflowing, if both Kun Thanaton and Kun Parit wish to have an initial conversation, a comment on each other presentations, please feel free to do so. Uh, I know that Kun Thanaton is really uh, actively responding to question in Q&A right now, but if both of you have uh, an initial conversation you want to comment on one another, uh, please do so. And if don't, then I would read some Q and uh, some questions. May I? Yes, please. Well, I would like to support Kun Parit's campaign. I mean, it's very important um, to, uh, I, I think this campaign is very important um, in two ways. First of which is that the, first of which is that the content, um, there's no other political organizations trying to um, go as far as the, they are trying to do right now. What will be in the parliament, in my opinion, is that they will keep on focusing on the election, election regulations, election laws, and the, the power of the senators to vote for the prime minister, and that's it. Um, unelected powers inside the constitution will still be there. No political organization is now campaigning on this content to abolish this, um, these mechanisms. So this is the only campaign in the public sphere that um, um, trying to um, um, make the public aware of the, of the, of the abolishment of these mechanisms. So the, um, if you are Thai and you are out there um, listening to both of us, we would like to urge you to join this campaign. The second point is that, um, of course, in effect, I mean, the output of the campaign, um, it will be naive to think that we will succeed in pushing this draft um, um, past pass it in the parliament and um, amend um, the content, the undemocratic content in the constitution. I think it would be too naive. But I think what's more important is the, the numbers, um, is the number game. If we could reach something like a million names, um, I think that we, it will be impactful. It will be, it will create a, a, a uh, 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 a leverage um, for the establishment to think of, to think twice to do something about this. Otherwise, we have no leverage. Um, so uh, that's why I think this campaign is important. Yeah. So uh, it's almost like a political mentoring have <laughs> that we are having here live. So Kun Parit, if you have any responses to uh, Kun Tanaton comments on your project. Um, no, I mean, I just um, would like to, I believe that Kuntanaton is joining, potentially joining later this afternoon as well. So um, uh, I think, yeah, but I think just to reiterate what Kuntanaton mentioned, that the number will be very important. Now, getting a high number is not so easy because in Thailand, currently to sign up for a certain, um, um, a certain legislation proposal, you have to actually have like a copy of your ID um, as well as you have to physically sign um, a set of papers. So we're hoping that um, the current law that is currently, I think, recently passed the third stage of, of, um, of, of, of parliament uh, will be put in place soon, which will enable people to be able to, to submit their signatures, um, at least without having to, to, to take a physical copy of that national ID or even potentially through an online method. But I think, yeah, I think anyone who is listening who is in Thailand right now, I urge you to, to join our campaign and, and submit your signature either via coming to our event this afternoon or via um, the postal system. All right, uh, let's get to the questions. So uh, there are so many of them and um, I would take the prerogative to read some of them and my apologies in advance if I'm not uh, reading your questions. Um, first question, 
that uh, Mr. Tanaton has already answered to, but I think it is very worthwhile to uh, answer publicly. And it's also addressed to both of you from uh, Kun Tri Thep, a graduate student, uh, political science, University of Florida. There are two questions. First, while your progressive movement is for Mr. Tanaton, is doing an applaudable job campaigning across the country to raise political awareness, Examples around the world and across history show that a successful and peaceful transition from authoritarian rule is unfortunately made possible by the participation and more or less willingness of the ruling parties, interest groups, or elites. Given the current situation in which the elites seem recalcitrant, what is your opinion? What in your opinion could be done to convince the elites to participate in a transition endeavor they may not even be interested in? And the second question along the same line, is it indeed possible for the opposition camp and pro-democratic civil society groups, such as a progressive movement, to press or persuade the center-right parties, for example, the Democratic Party and the Pum Jai Thai Party, to join the genuine democratization endeavors? So like I have already written in my answer, I think I totally agreed. Um, if you want to make the transition to democracy peaceful, um, you have to convince them that it's a better choice um, to continue the repressive regime would be uh, a worse choice. In order to persuade them, you need numbers. That's why I'm saying that uh, the numbers of the people who signed up for the Kun Parit's campaign will be important. Um, it, it's our leverage. Maybe it's a little um, hopeless, but it's the only leverage we have, the numbers. So the right now, I think it's clear they don't think that we gain popularity enough. Uh, I mean, the third demand, the, the, the reform of monarchy is popular enough. We have the momentum enough um, to convince them to talk. So without leverage, um, they don't talk. They are in the higher position. So um, it's not easy. As for the second question, um, I leave the Democrat Party um, problem to Kun Parit, but um, I associate quite um, um, a lot with the Pum Jai Thai members of the Pum Jai Thai Party. And no, I don't think we can convince them to, to support a democratic agendas. I refuse to believe that Pum Jai Thai can be changed, not with the current leadership. Yeah, I think uh, two questions on that. Um, first, sorry, two answers on that. Firstly, on, on, on practical terms, right? I think that the numbers game is very important. And you notice that actually, if you look at what happened in parliament um, in November last year, when seven kind of drafts of constitutional, constitutional amendment proposal were put in place. Um, there were a few drafts that actually were able to get the support of a few military appointed censors. So for example, the draft or the fourth draft that was to remove the power of the Senate um, to elect prime minister actually received the support of 50, I think if I remember correctly, 54 senators. Now, I believe that that's not because these senators suddenly have a, a conscience um, or a democratic conscience, but it is they are pressured by what's happening outside of parliament when they're seeing huge numbers of people coming out to campaign and call for constitutional amendments. So I think firstly, don't underestimate the power that the movement outside parliament can have in terms of changing how uh, people inside parliament vote. But secondly, I think it's also a battle of ideas in the sense that uh, we have to be able to convince members of, of the public that the proposals that we have put in place in this campaign is not a proposal that will give any political party um, any advantage. It is simply a proposal to create a neutral system that allows all parties to compete on equal terms. We're not saying that we want to change a military appointed Senate to be a, 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 a Senate appointed by, by, by people in the opposition. We're, we're asking for no Senate, um, no senators to be involved um, in the legislative um, process and leave it to the 500 um, elected MPs. So I think that battle idea is very important that what we're doing is not something that will give us an advantage, but it's a a neutral system that simply allows for that to be free and fair competition across all parties. Now, I think to the, the second question on what we can do um, regarding the, um, the, the pro um, or the, the coalition parties at the moment, I have to say, having experienced it uh, firsthand, 
if I believed that there was a chance um, of it really happening, I would not have left the Democrat Party. Um, on the day that I resigned, when they decided to, to join with uh, the current government, um, the people that were voting um, on that motion, I think the results came out 80% um, in favor of joining, 20% not in favor of joining. So you can see that um, there are probably very few, if any, right now in the Democrat Party who believe similar to what I believe in. Um, but I think one thing to bear in mind is that as the, the, the four year term gets closer towards its end, I think politically you will see the Democrat and the Pum Jai Thai parties um, potentially making certain moves to try and find their own political space. Now, if that kind of shakeup um, is happening, I think what we can do is to be ready with a proposal to submit to parliament so that we don't wait around until that happens before we have our proposal ready. So I think if we have um, this proposal with enough signatures ready, we can wait for the right time um, to submit um, this um, legislation and hopefully it will be um, at a period where we can gather support from the, um, from the coalition parties. But I think lastly, just want to make out that it is actually a shame that when we talk about um, left and right here in Thai politics, the right is always associated with people who don't want democracy. I'm sure this is not the case in, in the US, right? Where left and right are both kind of uh, firm believers in a democratic system, but they simply have different ideological viewpoints on how to run the economy or certain kind of social policy. So I think a, 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 an important um, battle that we have in place right now in Thailand is how to make sure that we that the right in Thailand um, actually um, also stand firm in a democratic system. Next question. Um, I also have to say that Kun Thanathorn has really good taste in answering the question. There, he is answering all the good question. I'm also going to um, ask again, uh, but this time addressed to both of you. Um, this question is from Kun Thanet Ayara Nakparak. Kun Thanathorn. The question is Kun Thanathorn coming from the capitalist group and Kun Parit coming from the traditional elites group. Both of you have the insider's views of how these people think and operate. Are you optimistic about them going to comply with the democratization process uh, in Thailand? Kun Parit, do you want to do it first? Okay, sure. Um, I think, um, yeah, so I, I do live in a, uh, I guess in an extended family who, I think the majority probably believe the opposite to what I believe in. And I try to kind of analyze this question quite heavily. Um, I think part of the reason that the older generations in Thailand are not such strong believers in democracy is because of the narrative about 20 years ago, actually when the 1997 constitution came out that tried to paint politicians in a very bad light. So in Thailand, there is this ongoing narrative um, 20 years ago that politicians are bad people I mean, we need to design a system that prevents politicians or these bad people from having too much power. Now, I think uh, on the one hand that led to um, certain um, creation, a creation of certain kind of mechanics of checks and balances, which one could view um, as being um, a, a good side effect um, of that narrative. But I think the danger of that narrative is, it, that, is that it now um, we have a set of generations who are generally quite suspicious um, of politicians. So whenever we talk about the, um, democracy, which by nature means increasing the power of the people, which are um, basically um, are passed on to elected politicians at, at the general election, we have a set of generations who are quite mindful and quite suspicious of kind of um, any moves that might empower um, these elected politicians. So I think that is a narrative that we have to fight against uh, when we talk about trying to convince um, the, the older generation. So the more we can make politics a space where capable um, and well-intentioned um, people want to join and showcase to these people that actually not all of politicians are bad um, in the way that they believe. And I think that's one way to try and, to try and convince um, these people. In my case, you've got to understand that the, the Thai economy. There's too many sectors that are under the oligopolistic structure or um, monopolistic structure. And when you have this kind of a uh, oligopolistic structure, people at the top can dominate the whole supply chain, can dominate the whole supply chain. So people who are in the middle of the supply chain, tier two, tier three in the supply chain, they cannot um, rebel 
against the people at the top, right? So this kind of a this kind of the mode of capital accumulation um, doesn't allow people in the middle to express their political wills. So I think um, that is uh, the problem. And besides, you got to understand that uh, the they have a way to manipulate the um, the way of thinking through the um, the control of trade associations, for example, the Federation of Thai Industries. If you look at the president of the Federation of Thai Industries, they are basically um, those who coming nominated from, you know, cement group, CP and the likes, you know, big conglomerates. So um, uh, another good example would be the president of the, um, how you call that, Hokan Ka, the, how you call that, the, Thai Chamber, Chamber of, of Commerce. Commerce. Yes, the Thai Chamber of Commerce. The president of Thai Chamber of Commerce always have the support from these big conglomerates. So it will be very difficult to, to convince these people because um, at the end of the day, it's not about political ideology. It's about business interest. So we are talking about business interest here. If you, you, know, if you go against um, the Thai, you may lose your business. You may lose your fortune. Um, I am more hopeful in working with the, the, the new business owners. I think these people um, suffer from the money, uh, oligopolistic structure of the Thai economy and they tend to be against the status quo. So when I work with these people, they, some of them understand that the reason they don't have enough business opportunities because of this, the, the, the network, the alliance of these unelected forces. So I think I'm more happy working with um, um, people in the mid tier, second tier, third tier in the market rather than the big conglomerates. I don't think uh, in big uh, working, you can convince the, the executives, the owners of big conglomerates to um, be um, supportive of a democratic agenda. The next question comes from Kun Taiwat, Tai Ratana Warakun uh, from uh, Sloan MBA at MIT. The question is, while there are polarizing views on the third demand, since many view this issue through a binary lens, do you both believe that Thailand as a society can reach a consensus on the second demand, at least, uh, a genuine constitutional amendment to remove unelected forces. What are the sentiments on the ground nationwide beyond Bangkok? And this question about um, the, the rift between Bangkok and the provinces are also uh, widely asked. So uh, I want both of you to reflect on that as well. Well, well, uh, you got to understand uh, when you talk about social theory, social science is unlike um, science in the sense that you know in science you can um, you can control variables and see if this variable change what's what is the effect to the result, right? But um, in social science, you can you cannot basically turn back time and change one factor and see what's the different um, will be. You cannot do that in social science. So it's very difficult to prove which is a correct um, way. Um, some saying that, you know, we need to um, tone down the third demand and focusing on the first and the second demand, namely to get the um, Prayut Janosha out, number one, and number two, to amend the constitution. But the other idea which I kind of... Um, convinced is that you have to talk about the third demand in order to get the first and the second demand. If you don't talk about the third demand, there's no leverage. They kill you, they shoot you, they put you into jail, they persecute you. So the only way to make the first demand and the second demand comes true, you need to talk about the third demand. So um, so that's, that's what I, what I believe. If you're focusing on the first demand and the second demand, you will never get um, both of them, either of them. But again, there's no way to prove if it's right or wrong, it's not science. 
Yeah, so I think, I mean, all three demands are necessary, but I think I think Kun Trai Wat is probably right in the sense that, uh, at least from my personal experience, the second demand tends to be the one that is able to gather uh, more support. And I think, uh, but one thing I think that's very important across all three demands, whether it's um, constitutional amendment or, or reforming the monarchy, is how, how those demands are presented uh, matters as well, in the sense that um, I ran a poll once um, where uh, we asked two different sets of questions. The first set is we asked if you agree with um, certain groups of protesters, both kind of the pro-democracy and the, I guess the anti-democracy protesters. Um, and we also asked kind of what, if you agree with that, with their certain proposals. But the second set of questions is we asked, we remove all kind of mentions of like who presented or who suggested um, or proposed these proposals, but asked simply from the content, do you agree with X, Y, Z? And what we notice is actually in the second set of question, we are able to get a larger proportion of people being in support of those content. So I think right now we have, I think as a result of 10 to 20 years of, of heavy kind of political polarization, we have a, a society that is ready to judge the, the, whether they support a certain proposal more on whether, more on who is presenting them rather than the actual content. So I think what's very important in this fight for all these three demands or even um, the second one on constitutional amendment is how do we persuade um, um, either political parties or, uh, or people from the other side of the aisle to join with our campaign. So for example, this campaign to amend the constitution that we are launching today cannot just be sign up. Um, it can't be a campaign where only people who voted uh, for certain parties join up, but it has to be a campaign where regardless of which party you voted for last time, you can join our forces. And I extend my inv invitation to even parties in government at the moment, that what we are proposing should be something that you can support as well. So I think that that's very important in terms of gathering and and changing that perception, that that misunderstanding that this campaign is 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 purely um, for just one side or, or one one political party. If I could add one more point to Kun Parit's um, um, point, is the is the doing this campaign would allow us to talk to communicate with the people is not only in Bangkok um, today that we plan to organize an event, but we plan to do this in universities, in communities um, across the country. So you will be seeing um, us doing this campaign throughout the country and it will give us the, the, the opportunity, the chance to talk to the people, to explain to them um, why um, amending the constitutions, why abolishing these bodies are necessary to the to the arrival of the democratic Thailand. So I think this is what I said. It's to camp you have to campaign, you have to communicate, you have to get your message, your message across. If you cannot do that, you lose. You lose. So the next question might be a challenge to um, perhaps both of your uh, political commitment and um, vocation. Uh, it's just a challenging question. So uh, the question is from Kun Satirat Palakan, and it goes as following. With the history of failures in constitutional reforms, parliamentary, parliamentarianism, and even electoral democracy, should we not look at other forms of politics other than liberal democracy to achieve liberation from autocracy, something in the left-wing persuasion of proletariat and peasant-based revolution and others? Well, I have no problem with that. I mean, um, what we need right now is a safe place to debate what kind of the future we want, right? Now, even a basic democracy, you cannot have it. There's no safe place to uh, debate further. So, I mean, you can only do that. I mean, look at the development of the Western societies. Um, you can, how you call it, you, you can have a revolution the, um, in 18th century, 19th century, but, you know, in 21st centuries, um, the modernization of weapons is far beyond imagination. So, so basically you cannot topple a government and a, a, a regime with force anymore. So the, 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 I, think, I think 
we need to achieve this um to achieve this uh uh what you call liberal democracy in order for us to um have a safe space in order for us to in order to allow thai people to imagine what kind of society we want to be in what kind of future we want to see you know so if you can break this gala or the 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 break this the power of unelected forces i think that's the beginning the, um, it's a new chapter it's it would create the space safe space for people to start imagining other possibilities and i think that is very important you you know we are not armed we don't have guns we don't have tanks to topple the the government the regime so it's it's very difficult to achieve um anything beyond liberal democracy to um in the current um situation i think it's a it's a good question and i think it's a message is this exact kind of message that should be put forward to the people who are in charge of the system or the prayut regime right now in the sense that the more and more they make it impossible to achieve any change or any reforms through parliamentary means then the more and more will people be pushed to their limits and they will start exploring kind of extra parliamentary and more revolutionary means so i think this is a very important plea and, and similar to what i uh, mentioned in the talk which is that they um the the pre regime needs to give way um in order to allow for peaceful transition because if if they do not then the tension is only going to become stronger people are going to lose more hope of what's happening in parliament people are going to switch off entirely and they don't care at all about um any elections under the current set of rules or anything that happens inside the current parliament and they will start exploring other methods so i think this is an important message to get across but i think the other part of that question is kind of um what kind of economic model uh, or what economic ideology should be put forward i think that this is something which um we should allow for all kind of all different viewpoints to be to be freely expressed but i think until we get that political um democratic system in place first that allows for each economic ideology to be able to compete um and have a fair shot on equal grounds and i think um it's going to be it's going to be very difficult for 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 us to to have that meaningful debate let me give an, my observation on this you you do see what you seeing now in the thai society um is the radicalization of the of the people right and i've been asking myself a lot lately why and i come up with the answer that there's no middle ground for debate for talk you know uh uh a program like kun jom khwan you know kun jom khwan uh nam sukun alai na kun jom khwan uh lao phet the the tv uncle a programmer in the um, tv7 um station you know that kind of platform where you put people with with two different opinions sit together and debate on the content of their opposing views i think that kind of programs that kind of platforms is very important to the health of democracy once you terminate you not allow those kind of a uh, a space for people to come and talk to express their opposing political opinions then you radicalize people you know, you know people go to the far end of the spectrum because there's no space in the middle to talk and i would like very much to see a uh, more um more kind of this um safe public space for people to talk to debate and i think having this we will put we will pull the people back to the middle rather than pushing people away um to the far side of the political wheels that's my observation and uh we're two minutes over time but we are going to have the last question um from kun petri somwong which is uh also a question that is asked by many um and the question is i would like to ask for opinions regarding the international help and thai politics do you think how much can international community 
uh, could put pressure to the Prayut regime and to what extent the global solidarity may have impact upon the dictator's rule. It seems that the regime doesn't care much of how it is perceived among the global community at all. And we'll end this with this question and any other messages that both of you might have. Okay, I'll go first. Um, I think um, to answer the question on international support, I think, I think um, obviously we cannot rely solely on international support to develop democracy in Thailand, right? I think at the end of the day, uh, we need to build um, a democratic society from within the country as well. We need to build, uh, make sure that we have 60 million people um, or the entire population that is that, that believes in and calls for and wants to maintain um, this democracy, right? So I think um, solely relying on international um, assistance is probably not the way forward. But having said that, I think getting um, international support on, on key issues that are really um, important um, is, 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 is critical as well. So I think the more that we are able to get um, international organizations or even um, countries leading democracies around the world to at least stand firm on certain non-negotiation um, 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 issues, for example, um, calling on the government to abide by international law when handling protesters or calling out any certain legislation that may contradict um, international human rights and um, um, standards, then I think it, it, it's critical, right? But I think there comes a time where, um, just like Kuntanathan's answer on the current kind of economic um, climate in Thailand and, and how businesses need to weigh up between their kind of their personal ideology and their um, economic interests. I think there comes a time where, where countries around the world need to, need to um, walk the walk as well, in the sense that are they willing to, to use kind of economic um, um, sanctions or economic um, levers to try and, um, and, and use it as a way to negotiate for these kind of international democratic principles and standards. Um, I think um, just ending this talk, since it's the last question is, I think finally just to urge all of you, um, whoever is in, I, I saw a question come in as well about how they can participate in the campaign if they are um, not in Thailand. I think if you're in Thailand, um, you can come and sign um, for our constitutional campaign either um, at our events, which we will hold across the country, or you can go to um, the website, which I will post um, straight after this um, in the chat box where you can mail in um, your, your, your forms as well. If you are abroad, I think if you're willing to mail in internationally, that is also an option. But I think once the new laws are in place, and I, have, I can't promise when that will be, um, we will um, update um, um, everyone as quickly as possible on our social media channel as well as on our, on our website in terms of how you can participate. But I think even if you can't um, participate individually or personally, if you can at least kind of share and, and tell your, your friends in Thailand um, that this campaign is happening, um, then I think that would be um, a critical step as well towards getting the numbers needed to, to try and force through this change. My answer to the question will be that um, we got to understand that the general democracy, sustainable democracy cannot be built top down. It has to be ground up. So, in the, so the burden of, um, of pushing, um, the, pushing the boundary for the democratic Thailand is the burden of the Thai people. And Thai people alone can build a Thai, um, sustainable Thai democratic society. Um, no other nations could bear this burden. So, but international community could help. Um, and I think the easiest way to help advocate for basic human rights and that being the rights to assemble, rights to free speech. These are the only weapons we have. Without rights to free speech, without rights to assemble, we basically have no weapons. So um, um, advocate for us on this basic item, basic human rights and, and the, uh, I, I think that could help a lot. International solidarity is very important in this sense because we have to understand that a threat to democracy anywhere is a threat to democracy everywhere. And um, I believe that um, global community 
we share the same the same uh, belief that the people are equal people are created equal and that uh, and that the a challenge um, especially in a, a world where um, china is a rising power and we see how close our government is with the chinese government and that is another topic that worth um, exploring more um, but again the, it has to be built grow up it's it's our burden is the burden of thai people Loss. And thank you both Kuntanathan and Kun Parit for a thought provoking and sober discussion and really taking your time and energy to reply to all the challenging questions. If Sarah doesn't have any other announcements, we'll be officially ending this webinar. Yes, thank you everyone for attending. We're sorry we could not get to all the questions, but um, we believe the most crucial ones were answered. Thank you very much. And we hope to post this to our YouTube channel. Uh, we will be conferring about that with the speakers after the event. So thank you very much for attending. Likewise, thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And feel free to leave. Uh, we know you have your day busy day ahead of you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and okay, good go up. Have a good night over there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>